Welcome back. Uh, the second lecture of the uh, second module um, of the course Knowledge and Data will be about knowledge graphs on the web, also known as linked data, as we're going to call them, in, and sometimes also the web of data or the semantic web. Um, I've just been talking about uh, how to publish data on the current web and to consume data that has been published on the web in the, the current format. And that these way of doing this in, a, in the silo way, data silos, that this is very unhandy. Um, and that um, the other way of doing this as a publishing data as a, for human consumption on websites, that this is also not the right for, way forward. So knowledge graphs come to the rescue here. And uh, I will discuss uh, some of these things here. So I hope you have watched the video from Tim. It's always fun to watch videos from Tim. So his ambition was in the beginning of the 2000s to, to push people to uh, developing this web of data and the technology that is needed for it. And let's see how this worked out. The problem that we face is that we often, very often face very complex problems that either we as humans have to, to invest a lot of knowledge in, have the knowledge in the first place, and then really combine the information that we can find somewhere on the web, and that we would like to have this in a machine processable way and also have, have processed by machines. And all this information is around. There are textbooks about enzymes and so forth. There is, um, um, there is a, a Wikipedia public information about the transduction pro, uh, processes. Um, and there is more information from scientific sources as well. And the only thing we need to do, the only thing, sounds very simple, the only thing we have to do is to combine this data in, an, in the right way. So to, to write a query that, com, that has access to all these information sources and combines them in the right way. And this is part of what we're going to look at in this module. Because the data sets, they are, they are linked nowadays, or se several of them. So I took a, a, a snapshot of a, one of the presentations from uh, 2009, Linked Data Meetup, where you can see that there have already been uh, several data sets, such as Drug, drug Bank and um, Disease um, and Cider and uh, a Gene uh, data set, and DBpedia all combined, where certain uh, databases about the chemicals um, and the pharmaceutical information and the, uh, the clinical information are all linked to each other. This is mostly about drugs, as you can see, but um, uh, the same picture holds if you're also more on the, on the clinical side. So in this uh, specific presentation that was given in 2009, they were really merging several databases of knowledge about the chemical makeup of effective solutions um, in order to look into natural remedies. Um, so this is a very interesting combination. And you see that even for this case, there are already many databases linked and usable in that sense. And if you try to do the same with the question about the transduction and the, the pyramidal neurons, then you will see that there is many data sets around that provide really the structured information for this, um, for this, this query. And if you combine this in the right way and ask the right query, then you get 32 results and all are the correct answers. So the information is there, but it's extremely difficult to find unless we really formalize the knowledge. I showed you previously this, the current structure of the web of texts and documents and pictures, and that although all the information that is nowadays provided really comes from data sources, databases, that the databases themselves are not accessible. And if we can manage to do this, then we can really uh, create a web of data that is both navigable for machines, but can also still remain useful for people. Let me give you an example of how this still works. So we have a duality of uh, this uh, UK legislation website, for example, where you have a, a website that is about the Data Protection Act. Um, and it's produced from underlying structured data. So this is exactly the same information um, or the same data. And this one is in RDF, the format that we're going to look into in a, in a minute. Um, and this one is the, the HTML version that has been produced out of this RDF data. So we can make use of this data now in a formal way, 
with the former system and reasoning over it and querying and so forth, because we have the RDF version as publicly available data, but we can also still have the human readable versions. Um, and this is one of the advantages of having the data in these web formats published on, uh, on in, in standard uh, uh, web standards. So let's see how this works. Tim suggested four different ways of doing this. Websites publish their information in a machine readable format. So that's what we just saw of this data set. The data published is linked. We haven't seen that yet on this data set, but this is also very important. Oh, I should have said that the machine readable format is what we are tackling in, in the module two, and the linking is what we're tackling in the module five. There needs to be domain knowledge available so that the machines can make use of the data to really get information out of it. And then machines can find and combine published information to answer user information needs. And this is what you're going to do in the final project. This is obviously the question, how do you want to do this? What is the, 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 the technology and the social impact of what, 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 ha what has to happen? Um, and again, uh, there, the Tim came up, or the, the Link Data Initiative, uh, I think in general, came up with four proposals, and we briefly discussed them. So everything that you talk about should have a name, and it should have a unique name. So that's very important. It's, it's part of the language RDF, which we'll be discuss in a minute. So when you want to talk about objects in your knowledge graph, give all the things a name. And this is also what makes it also very strong because um, these, these, we can now assign names, uh, meaning to those names as well. So once we have uh, identified that every resource should have a name, um, there is a claim that there should also be addresses on the web. Because now we, what we can say is that we build information, so that's me now, building information in, in ways of a knowledge graph where we assign a property to two objects where one of them might be at a location in a museum and one of them might be in a location in a, in a database such as uh, DBpedia about encyclopedic knowledge. And this is possible now because we have the uniform resource identifiers that are naming, is a naming scheme for addresses on the web. And that means basically that I can make statements about other data sets in the, in the, in the graph form. So this is what I said. Now I, I can make statements about other things and whether they now live this movie and the single man and Damien Lewis and Claire Danes, whether this information now lives on my own machine or whether it lives somewhere on the web, doesn't matter because each of the nodes now is identified by a, a URI, or, or nowadays it's called an IRI, but which is a unique identifier on the web. So that's very powerful. Once we do this, we really create on the web infrastructure a global graph of linked data. And this linked, this global graph is a knowledge graph, the one we discussed last week. So one thing I also discussed last week is that the data itself is valuable. It becomes already richer by sharing and by linking, but it's very important to also make explicit the meaning of the things that we talk about. So it's not just data, but it's also the underlying model and it's background knowledge that we need. So the underlying model would, for example, say that we can assign types to things or time types to relations, and then organize the types in a hierarchy, such as Linnaeus did with types of uh, species. And then based on these types, we can define rules of calculating what knowledge is a valid conclusion or is entailed as we discussed in the first week. And this is done by imposing constraints on possible interpretation. So this is the way we see knowledge bases. They just allow us to specify what models are allowed and what the properties of these models are. So modeling is finding a representation that restricts our possible interpretations of the world. And they are meant as explicit formalizations of understanding, structuring, predicting, and communicating. So we have, for example, taxonomies where species are uh, organized in genus, families, 
it's a very typical thing in, in biology that you say, okay, every line is a mammal and every mammal is a is a, an animal and obviously all these difficult uh, classes, classes of species in between. There's domain modeling as you would do in uh, YOML, numerical models, uh, statistics, uh, stock markets and so forth. And the web of data uses what's called vocabularies or ontologies to model this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, knowledge. And once we have these knowledge, these knowledge bases that we can also model in terms of knowledge graphs, we can calculate um, uh, on the basis of a, of a general understanding of the meaning of the numbers where we know the semantics of the arithmetics, but don't need to really know what the instances of the arithmetic is. So we basically find an algorithm that implements our semantics uh, without us necessarily having to understand the meaning of the numbers that we talk about. So if you have a, a statement like A owns X Bs and A gets another Y of Bs, then A now earns X plus Y Bs. It doesn't matter who is A who's, and what the Bs are. We can always conclude that if Blaze owns one rabbit and he gets another four, then we have five. And that is not because we know anything about the objects themselves, but that's because we know, we understand the semantics of the, of the, 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 the operators as we introduced last week. If we calculate with knowledge, then we do inferencing on the basis of the, the notion of attainment, where we don't re look at the meaning of the words of the argument, we look at the meaning of the operators and the structure of the, the argument. And this is the, the, an old insight in logic that you look at the meaning of the operators, the, the argument is what you formalize. And now these, these arguments, they are valid for any kind of proposition in this case or interpretation of the letters A, B, C, and D. So if we now have this example of all rabbits are cute, some pets are rabbits, then we all know that we can conclude some pets are cute, which means that this is, is entailed, is an abstraction over the set of all possible uh, uh, interpretations of rabbits and, and of, of the letters A, B, and C, and, and so forth. And based on this abstraction, we have a notion of entailment, of truth that we can derive, predictable inference, and we also have an algorithm uh, and a reasoning algorithm to calculate now with this knowledge. So if we want to query, then um, we can take all the explicit statements out of a knowledge base that are already done. So for this, data might need to be connected and we need to understand the data model. And then we can ask a query. If we have a statement, all rabbits are cute, some pets are rabbits, then we can ask for, give me the first statement about are rabbits cute or not? This is not all we can conclude because sometimes we also want to do inference over a web of data. And then if we have a model that's understandable by machines and that comes with formal semantics that are shared, then we can always derive the same thing so our inference becomes predictable. So then we can derive that some pets are cute because we know that all A are Bs and some Cs are, are As implies that some Cs are B. So now we have enriched our database, our knowledge base here with some formal knowledge that we have specified here as a rule so that we can derive a new fact that some pets are cute, which logically follows in a predictable way based on the formal semantics and the notion of attainment that we discussed last week. And this is something that a machine can easily calculate and that you also will do very soon and look into. So back to, to Tim, we look at querying an RDF in module one, publishing the information in a machine readable format on the web. And this is exactly what we're going to do in the first, in, in the second practical. We're going to query the web in a machine readable format, web data, and use it for internal uh, manipulation. Um, we will um, uh, link data sources, we will do the domain knowledge, but we will postpone this to later. So now in this module, we will really focus on the publishing and accessing machine readable format on the web. And this is what the data model of RDF is for. So how did we manage to get there? Uh, and this is a part from 
um, partially in, in technological engineering. So there has been a lot of technology really uh, implemented and tested and invented. And some of it you will see in, the, in this course. But there's also social engineering. So you standardize things. It's just really a big thing that you really need to, to have the same formats that are used on, from different companies, universities, and so forth. Um, and there's always a trade-off that you need uh, to, to try to, to advance technology as much as possible, but you also need to get the people involved to join the effort. So what kind of technology have been standardized? There is a, a standardization of the names that we give objects on the web. So the uniform resource identifiers are meant to avoid naming conflicts. And they are basically now based on the standard URL syntax of, of web objects. We use the HTTP protocol that has been around since the invention of the, the web. So you can write in a command line, you can write curl minus L minus H, except so that's the header that you send with this. And this curl program will send out an HTTP transport protocol um, uh, request to the website, HTTP, data, DB, PDF, resource, and so forth, and return whatever is written there on this website in RDF format. Um, there are some namespaces, it's not another standard that we don't have to deal with this horrible long uh, prefix to the URIs. But now we just use an abbreviation. So namespaces are abbreviations of URIs. Um, and RDF is the main framework where we basically have a, a knowledge graph where each of the nodes has, can be an object, a resource, and, and, and defined or, or identified by an, a URI or um, a variable or a literal, which we will discuss in a minute. And based on these triples, these statements, we can build graphs, knowledge graphs, that are really uh, very powerful elements to which we can later also add more expressive semantics. And then one final thing is that we there are different syntaxes. It's also a technological standard that everybody who gets a document understands it in exactly the same way. So a syntax that is defined, that's also called a serialization. More standards are, are libraries. They're more on the vocabulary side uh, um, as well. So these libraries are help you to manipulate RDF. You'll see RDF lib in the practicum, which is very handy to get you uh, um, uh, all these the string uh, of, of these uh, string manipulations that you had to do in the first um, assignment. Um, we have a, a query language that allows us to, to ask queries via the web, via HTTP as a protocol. Uh, we have uh, databases that are called triple stores to store large volumes of RDF data. You will see Stardog later. Uh, we have a language of formal expressive modeling, which is called OWL. And we have editors for those. And you will see some of those. And they are really become standard tools that can be used uh, very widely. Um, and reason is to, to infer new knowledge. So. So the main things that we just should come back to is that we should name things and use your eyes for it. We should use your eyes with HTTP so that, that people can really get some results back by a get call uh, via the HTTP protocol and then get information about the names back in a machine readable format. And uh, that's the third point that if we ask such a query that we also get useful information back in RDF so that we can uh, have formally specified knowledge. And um, the more links to other URIs we add, the more integrated this becomes to the global uh, web of knowledge and can be discovered and can be reused and so forth. These four principles we'll uh, discuss now in the remaining module. Um, we won't think about uh, making knowledge explicit, that is for later. And Tim gives in one of the le later lectures that I, I want you to watch, he will discuss the different ways of publishing data in these, uh, this star model. So talking about technology, just to finish this off, is there is a, a, a stack of technology. And you see here on, on this side, you see the specification and the solution. So you have the, the web uh, dimension, you have the 
representation dimension on um, uh, what kind of uh, 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 syntax formats you have. You have the information exchange format, which is the data model, and that's sort of the abstraction over the different syntaxes. You have models to specify more complex uh, uh, knowledge. And for each of those um, uh, concepts and abstractions, you have some technology that implements these concepts. And this is the value of this uh, technology stack of the semantic web or web of data. Mm -hmm.